This is behind the scenes. I won't close my eyes and surrender. There will be no white flag behind us. Cool. Let's see if we can get that in the entire shot. Hey, what's up? How's it going? How are you guys doing this week? Hey, dude. We'll see oh, yeah. oh yeah, my pleasure. You guys don't mind Sterling. Wait. We're here with Sterling Lujan from Bitcoin.com. How's it going? It's going great. Can't complain. Uh, you uh, did a debate today with Peter Schiff. We're here at LibertyCon 2018. Uh, how, how did that go? Yeah, I think it went really well. There were some couple of aspects that I was a little bit upset about. I thought I, sh I, I thought I kind of got shafted on a little bit of the time and he uh -huh. monopolized a bit of it but i kind of expected that because <laughs> peter schiff kind of has talking points where he's really focused on uh -huh. on certain issues and he goes through the process so that wasn't a problem but i felt like the points i got to make were important mm. especially for the sake of what's going on in the cryptocurrency space and what his beliefs are in regards to cryptocurrency so that's fine other than that it was it was, it was excellent Mm -hmm. um, no, it was uh, that was my first cryptocurrency debate, and I rather enjoyed it. I, the, the talking points made a lot of sense uh, on both sides to me. I'm not a, a like I'm a total novice to the to the the whole concept of cryptocurrency, but uh, I understand certain words. So <laughs> it, it, was, it was it was just enough. It was you just know enough. you know what we call those right what? buzzwords right? Buzz <laughs> those are certain words people get used to. You in download them. <laughs> <laughs> you you mine them. My, in the computer? <laughs> so, Bitcoin.com, what is that? So, I have to start with this. A lot of people think, okay, you work at Bitcoin.com, you must be Bitcoin, right? You create all the Bitcoins. Yeah. That you're, you are the face of everything Bitcoin. So that's not entirely true. At Bitcoin.com, we don't control all the Bitcoins. That's what people seem to think. Saying that we control all the Bitcoins or our Bitcoin would be like saying the person who owns the domain for gold.com has control of all the gold, right? So it's, okay. just a, it's just a decentralized cryptocurrency that everybody can attempt to use, right? So we are a commercial company where we focus on educating the public on cryptocurrency, specifically Bitcoin Cash and Bitcoin. And we also have a smorgasbord of other things we do. One of the most important probably is we have a a mining platform where we actually allow people to, to sign up for smart contract mining. We do, we have a huge news team now. It's grown so fast. I'm really, really proud of it. The guys on the news team have built it up so large that we're getting about, let's say 10 million views per month on the news site. So it's grown precipitously. It's, an, it's just an, an, an amazing team on the news staff. Plus we have a lot of educational oriented things. We do newsletters. We have an academy where people can come educate themselves on cryptocurrency. So we really have our we really have our tendrils extended into a bunch of different places. As a retail company, having Bitcoin.com, there's no end to what we can do as a company. And so we try to do everything, but it's mainly it's mainly educational purposes. And me personally, I'm the communications ambassador for the company. So I literally my job is to hit the conferences, to scout out the conferences for possible sponsorship. I, I look at that as part of my job, and I also generally do keynote presentations. I do panels, and I, I exercise that directly. I educate people on cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, and on what we're doing at Bitcoin.com. So that's all an important piece of the puzzle in regards to what Bitcoin.com actually is. 
Okay. Uh, what do you think in terms of uh, altcoins and the number of them, as well as forks being uh, put into uh, cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. So personally, there's a lot of altcoins that I actually like, but 95 Maybe 99% of altcoins are, are nonsense, right? It's all, a good majority of them, It's it amounts to nothing but vaporware, right? It's like BitConnect? It's also, yeah, BitConnect. Bit, bit, bit bit, 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 bit What's that Yeah, that, that was just, uh, you know, people throw, throw around the term Ponzi scheme or pyramid yeah. scheme or scam in the space a lot. And that's not always true. A lot of things that people call a scam in the cryptocurrency space are just platforms that they don't like. But in the case of BitConnect, that turned out to be an actual <laughs> that was, an le- le- that was le- kind of legit, <laughs> legit Ponzi scheme. But yeah, and, and you're right. A, a lot of these cryptocurrency altcoins aren't actually cryptocurrencies. They're not even blockchain technology. Some of them aren't even vaporware. It's literally just a, a like plot. a hype coin. Yeah, that's right. It's a plot to, to get your money to. It's like a Supreme hat. That. <laughs> People line up outside for a Supreme T-shirt. That, that that's right. It's, okay. a, it's well, a way what, to fleece your pockets, yeah. right? What do you think about some of like the friendly fire within the crypto community in terms <laughs> of like like Max Kaiser on the Kaiser Report? He often is always saying things like he's a huge champion of Bitcoin, but Bitcoin Cash, he's like, oh, it's a scam. <laughs> but he's but and then he goes and does an interview. He does a debate with Peter Schiff, and he says Peter Schiff's like out of touch, and he thinks everything's he thinks Bitcoin's a scam. He's wrong on that. Do you ever see the hypocrisy within the Bitcoin community about where people are super religious or have faith when it comes to like their cryptocurrency of choice, but then they're like an atheist when it comes to like certain other altcoins? Yeah, that's an interesting way to put it. I think it's people that just have differing opinions. And we can get into the details of this. It has to do with the scaling debate. And the scaling debate basically denotes how should we actually grow and evolve Bitcoin in a way that's efficient, in a way that reaches the multitude of people so that we can have mass adoption. And what's happened in the scaling debate is people have taken rigid sides and they are highly opinionated about these sides. So it almost comes across like they have a religious, almost a religious like opinion. A because that's, that's right, because Ooh. that's how much zeal they have yeah. for this particular opinion. So my personal opinion, and this is a, a long discussion and we can have it if you guys want to, but you it, touched on something there. Yeah, like, the, well, this is a this is an, an in-depth thing, and we can discuss the history of it. But essentially, very early on in Bitcoin's existence, there were there were discussions. This isn't you know 2015, and that's early in the cryptocurrency yeah. space, right? <laughs> there were discussions on how to appropriately scale Bitcoin, and when I mean scale, if any if you guys are familiar with how blockchain technology works, basically there are, there are blocks, and on Bitcoin, these blocks have one megabyte of space, and that one megabyte of space, essentially, miners pick up transactions all across the globe and they etch them into the blockchain on a block. When that one megabyte is filled, a miner creates a special transaction where they receive a Bitcoin reward, and then they create a new block. But this miner, as they're doing this process of, of mining, they are racing other miners to solve a complex mathematical puzzle. And that's what allows them to get a Bitcoin reward. If they're the first one to solve this puzzle, or if these, the mining, mining computer, mining hardware solves this puzzle, a new block is created. And this yeah. goes on uh, effectively forever. Is that how blockchain works? That's how it works. And is that that's referred right. to as a hash or a hash rate? Or? Well, the, yeah, this, so um, yeah, a miner essentially, they, as they mine Bitcoins, cryptocurrency, they're running at a specific hash rate. And this hash rate has to do with how quickly they're able to solve this problem through the mathematics of hashing, right? Basically, it's about inputs and outputs and then cross-referencing those inputs and outputs. Kind of, kind of a technical thing, but basically how it works is they're, they're, they're verifying mm-hmm. and timestamping all these transactions so that there's redundancy in this system so that different miners can cross-check each other and make sure what's in the system is in the system. This is what... So Toshi Nakamoto, the, the original individual or group of people who created Bitcoin, they solved a problem, a computer science problem called the double spending problem. And all this means is if we created a digital token, generally speaking, we could just copy and paste that token anywhere and everywhere, and that would make digital it, currency. That, that's right. And, oh, it, and then it would have no value, yeah, uh, right, essentially. 
So this double spending problem was solved by having this massive network of computers with all this redundancy so they could cross-check each other and make sure this is a transaction that actually took place. Like if I send you Bitcoin, these miners pick up that transaction and put it in this, these blocks. So here's what's going on with the scaling debate. And we can tie, like I told you, this is, this is can, long technical. No, can go can ahead, I ask go a quick question? Sure, sure. Is blockchain like the cloud? So but that... This is an interesting thing. It's, it's part, like part, part, part. It's part of the cloud. It's a, it's abstract like that. It is on the internet. It's mm -hmm. uh, it's a it's another protocol. Like the internet is a protocol. Mm -hmm. Blockchain is also a protocol that's that's functioning sort of on its own on the internet. Okay. Right. So let's let's. So we have the a block one one megabyte of space in each of these blocks. Once these transactions get filled and the miners create a new block then it goes on and on, right? But here's what's happening. So many people have been rushing to get into, into Bitcoin and to adopt it and to use it. So many wallets have been opened up. And now it's got so full that people are trying to send transactions. And if their transactions aren't expedited, if they don't send a certain transaction fee, that those transactions go to this repository called the mempool. The mempool is just where excess transactions go when a a block gets completely full. So at one megabyte, it's filled up, and if there are so many transactions still out there, they, those go to the mempool, and the miners pick those up depending on how much the tra transaction fee that, that, that the individuals have, pay, have paid on a wallet, right? You can, some wallets allow you to set a transaction fee, and you can, if you set it lower, it may get set in this mempool if the blocks are already filled up, and then later on, they might get picked up and etched in, in the block. So this means that some people may try to send a transaction, but it doesn't clear on the blockchain for like a week because they didn't specify a higher payment. So th this is what's been called a fee market in the Bitcoin or the cryptocurrency space. So it's been, the, it's been a nasty thing, especially it's calmed down a bit, but over the last yeah. couple of months, it reached a fever pitch where it was so high that people weren't able to actually use Bitcoin because the fees got up to... I think at their peak, it nearly reached $40 to send a transaction. And this is, that's, that doesn't make the ease of use in a cryptocurrency good. If you pick up a cryptocurrency as just an end user and you want to send a transaction to someone, it's $40. Like, what the hell? It's Why not, would I do it's this? Not with Visa. That, that's right. I'm just going to use my Visa or my, yeah. my, my, my MasterCard. So what inevitably happened is this, they're, they're of course, Individuals arguing, like me, arguing that these block sizes just need to be expanded to accommodate more space on the blockchain and just allow more people to get involved. Is That seems like the obvious thing to do. Let's just expand the blocks a little bit so more people can use it to accommodate use. But there are these, these people, and they're part of a company called Blockstream, and then there's what we call core supporters, a core protocol group. And these individuals decided that Bitcoin doesn't need to scale, not right away at least. Mm -hmm. Scaling can wait until later, until we have all the technology here to make it happen. Their, their goal was that Bitcoin is digital gold anyway, so their notion okay. was that fees are a good thing. High fees are great because we have digital gold. Because they've, they've stopped treating it like a currency and more like a, a digital gold asset. Th that's right. They're, in their mindset, people don't need to transact Trade. with it anyway. It's no right? so, cryptocurrency right, that's or right. crypto asset. So their mission was to take their time and to languish away and to build these what they call second layer solutions around the blockchain. Basically, these these protocols and these software programs that interact with the blockchain but are not the blockchain. One, one of them is, it, well, they use a protocol called SegWit to allow this to happen. And what SegWit does basically is allow for like side chains to, to come off of the blockchain to work for transactions, but also something called the Lightning Network, which is the newest iteration of this idea, which is supposed to allow transactions to take place at light, lightning speed, literally and then get later, later on settled on the blockchain. But without getting to the, the technicality of that, this, this fever pitch debate raged for so long and people supporting Bitcoin Cash, which is what we're going to talk mm -hmm. about, want, want to expand the blockchain. Bitcoin Cash has been called a lot of things, Bitcoin ABC, Bitcoin Unlimited over the years, and this is just a proposition to just expand the block size to accommodate more users. But all these people wanting Bitcoin to be a di to be digital gold, as you pointed out, wanted to postpone all of that and use these second layer solutions that may eventually fix that. And 
we tried to get them to compromise, say, let's, why don't you, you can have your SegWit protocol that allow these second layer solutions, but let's go ahead and maybe just expand the block size one megabyte, make it two megabytes. Well, people who support core, who support Blockstream, weren't willing to compromise, and this is a historical thing, they referred to it as Franken-SegWit because it didn't keep with the promise of what SegWit was intended, and that's to keep the block size ultimately small and then later on fix it. So what happened as this thing culminated or came to its fruition, the Bitcoin Cash supporters, we decided to split off, right, and create a fork. This was in August of 2017, created a fork. So now there's effectively two chains of Bitcoin that share the same original history, but at this point now they share separate history. It's evolving. Right? So it's all so technically both chains are Bitcoin. One's Bitcoin Core mm -hmm. and one's Bitcoin Cash. But this new chain, Bitcoin Cash, we expanded the block size to be eight megabytes. You see, so okay. that more people can embrace the technology and use it without having to deal with high fees, without having to deal with this idea of gold, you know, okay. digital gold, which. I want to just make a brief comment about that. I think that's fine if somebody wants to have digital gold, if they want to accumulate value in a coin, that's great because that helps get a lot of people rich. But if you have a token that is digital gold and that accumulates value, but if it loses its value prop as a currency, which is what Satoshi Nakamoto, whoever the original inventor of Bitcoin is, if it loses that value prop where I can transfer it easily to anybody in the whole world, uh, borderless in a borderless fashion in a permissionless fashion across the globe with very low fees if it loses that utility then also it's going to use its lose its utility as a store of value yeah. because to be a store of value you have to have some kind of utility or some kind of use on a market so this was an economic argument that we had for why this is this waiting to do this segwit the segwit nonsense over time was a bad deal and it did negatively affect bitcoin and you see all the drama that cropped up around yeah. it. But now we've effectively split. We have Bitcoin Cash. It's working. We're building yeah. the infrastructure. Bitcoin is still functioning. Se SegWit is still underway. And they, they've claimed now that they've got Lightning Network on the main net. But there's like a handful of people who are using Lightning Network node because it takes time to get everybody involved yeah. in this new protocol upgrade, especially if you have a consumer business like Coinbase. You can't immediately get everybody using Lightning Network nodes so it's a complex code. It, it languishes away really slowly. If you just expand the block size, you have immediate accessibility to usability, right? And then later on, and that's just to say, as a company and me personally, second layer solutions are fine, but we need to do what Satoshi Nakamoto intended to do, and that's just to expand the block yeah. size to increase adoption. So anyway, that's this, this is the short and skinny on this very yeah. complex, very long-winded discussion about the scaling yeah. debate, but that's sort so, of how So it, for some of those second phase solutions, uh, would someone who is like a blockchain purist and, you know, believes that a lot of the value of cryptos is the blockchain technology, would they say, you know, those second phase solutions are really sort of hindering that any sort of that value or taking away from it? Yeah, so I mean, well, people who, who have read Satoshi Nakamoto's white paper and who understand the the importance of being able to scale very quickly so that a lot of people can use the technology. This is an economic, ultimately an economic decision rather than a technological one. The, these folks have an understanding for the purpose of that technology, which was to undermine trusted third parties, undermine central banks, undermine governments, and put economic power back into the hands of the individual. When you allow that, that ability for that to take place to languish away in oblivion through the slow process of becoming digital gold, it makes it easier for governments to control, for central banks to control. Mm -hmm. So I would say the, the cryptocurrency purists are cypherpunks, or people who believed in the spirit of evolutionary technology to break down governments and central banks. So these are the folks yeah. who want to continue getting this technology into the hands of as many people as possible, not slowing it down yeah. so that nobody can get involved in it. That's To me, that's bollocks, that's ludicrous. Yeah. If you do that, you're, you, you've, you've cut off the circulation of the technology, right? You've, hum, yeah. you've hamstringed it to such an extent that we can't, it's, it's unusable. So, but we've got to a point now where I think the drama is starting to get behind us because now, we, like I said, we have Bitcoin Cash, Bitcoin Core, now it's sort of a, a race of open competition on the market and we're gonna see which one succeeds. Yeah. And I think it's gonna be the one that is 
that has more usability on a market environment, and I think it'll be Bitcoin Cash every time. When okay. you say that what Bitcoin forked, mm. is it possible for another fork to happen? Yes, yes it is. Okay. That, and this is an interesting thing. These forks, Peter Schiff and I discussed this a little bit, and he has a bit of a confused idea on this idea of forking because he thinks it, it, it can go on infinitum. ad infinitum, which it can. But that doesn't mean that another fork is actually going to mean something. You have to build an infrastructure around that fork to oh, have value. Okay. This is called the network effect. So yeah, Bitcoin Cash forked, but we're already starting to work on the actual infrastructure because we believe in the technology. That's why BitPay <coughs> literally just accepted Bitcoin Cash for top offs on their credit card. Mm. And you know, I'm not I'm not real polished like Peter Schiff. I can't pull out my gold Visa card, my <laughs> oh, gold shit. Visa card, but I can pull out my BitPay card and show you how I can, how I can use that. But yeah. so so yeah, this is. This is the thing. It's anybody can create a fork at any time. They're on the in the in technological terms, these hard forks where a user base basically decides on a political level to go a different direction. It's called a user activated hard fork, and that's where you just you split and you go a different direction and you change the the consensus mechanisms or the protocol on a fundamental level. So you go a different direction. That's what happened with Bitcoin Cash. Thus, this idea of a user-activated hard fork. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. I really like um, something that's interesting to me is the network effect. And um, a lot of people that I listen to in like the Bitcoin community are would say that like Bitcoin, its value over other other altcoins is the size of the network. Like I've heard John Mac John uh, McAfee say that I've heard Mac Kaiser say that that its value is the network. And something that I find interesting is. Well, how Peter Schiff said, like, maybe Bitcoin will be like MySpace or Beanie Babies in the future, which always cracks me up. Uh, <laughs> can Bitcoin have its network contracted or be superseded by a competing uh, currency in terms of market cap? Yeah, 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 ab absolutely. And we've already seen that happen. So, but, I mean, here's the thing. It takes a little while. Once an infrastructure is built, that's a good thing for a cryptocurrency because the network effect takes place. But in an open market, even if you have a network effect, if you have a shitty token or you have shitty consensus rules, you're not going to survive into the future. A market is still a competitive cutthroat place that's not going to provide you with any quarter if you don't bring solutions to the people who are using your platform, even with a network effect. So, we, And we've seen this with Bitcoin. We have evidence of it. So... At one point, Bitcoin had a market dominance or a market cap, market share of roughly 90%. So over time, especially during the height of this scaling debate and the height of this fee market and slow confirmation times, you saw Bitcoin sink from about 90% market dominance to about, right now it's sitting at 35 40% market dominance. So the network effect, even if you have a giant infrastructure built up, if it's unusable, you're still going to start seeing it languish. And that's exactly why Bitcoin Cash has started to pick up. And now we're seeing a, a price point in Bitcoin Cash, roughly 1300 I looked at it earlier. It was a little under that. And at, I think at its height, it was nearly 3 k But, of course, there was a market contraction just a little while ago through the holidays as well, which probably had to do with some of this scaling drama. But, yeah, you're right. So if you build up a network effect, that takes a lot of work, a lot of infrastructure building. But by no means is that guaranteed to succeed in the long term. This is, a, is an open market, and to compete on that market, you have to continue building your protocol in such a way that makes it easily accessible for the user base. On that yeah. note, we'll be right back to you, back to you later. <laughs> Sterling Lujan, too bad, too late, Bitcoin.com. Well, you wanted to talk about the founding ideas behind cryptocurrency. You want to walk us through that? Yeah, sure. So the, there's a, you know, we talked about the scaling debate, and that stuff's, that stuff's very important for a reason, right? One of the reasons that our CEO, Roger Ver, and me personally believe that having an accessible cryptocurrency is so important because we're trying to bring this technology to the masses, to everybody, because this technology was created hands down, was created to liberate people from the depredations of government and central banking, from trusted third parties. So when you have a cryptocurrency technology, 
You have a technology where I can send money from myself, my wallet, to you, the counterparty, with no intermediaries. This is what we refer to, here's the buzzword, disintermediation. If you have a technology that allows for rapid disintermediation across society, you have a technology that is able to free people from governments. And this is super important because governments absolutely rely on a central banking cartel to control society. When these guys have the power to print money, to decide on interest rates in society, they ultimately have the power to create a feudal state where all of us are nothing but serfs. So if you take that power away from them via cryptocurrency technologies, via everybody being able to gain access to this technology, you effectively change the composition of society from a slave society to a free society. And this is, this is lost on a lot of people moving into this particular cryptocurrency ecosystem, especially if they think about just wanting to get rich and turn Bitcoin and cryptocurrency into digital gold. Yeah, that's important. I love getting rich. I've made money myself. But if, if that's the case, you've, you've absolutely lost track of the purpose of the technology. Making money is great, but isn't freeing ourselves even better? Because if we free ourselves from this tyranny, from the slave system, this fiat system, then we can make as much money as we want using these various technologies with no concerns whatsoever. So we have to embrace the e easy accessibility of cryptocurrency and bring it to the masses. That is of utmost importance. Now, let's talk a bit about the history of this. this these ideas originated with a group of people who lived in San Francisco and the, the, the Bay Area, <laughs> the Silicon Valley, these these guys were called the cypherpunks, and they had a mailing list very early on in the early 90s, like right as the internet was kicking off. And Timothy May, sort of the ringleader of this whole deal, came up with, he wrote a very, very concise, if you guys haven't read it, read it you have to check it out, very concise, very short article called the Crypto Anarchist Manifesto. And in this article, before cryptocurrency even came into existence, he envisioned it. He saw it coming. He said, what we're going to do is build technologies that bring privacy back to the individual, that bring anonymity back to the individual, that bring security back to the individual, all on a digital platform that allows easy accessibility for everybody. And we're going to use this to combat governmental systems, governmental spying campaigns, and it's all going to be loosely based around encryption-based technology. And there were several of these people involved in the cypherpunk movement. And they created a mailing list that was extremely popular. And a lot of people got involved on it from all walks of life, from all over the world. And it, it's what triggered developers and programmers and a smorgasbord of different, very talented individuals to start working on these technologies. And besides cryptocurrency, there was one individual who got a whiff of this, these ideas. His name was Phil Zimmerman. And he created, you guys may have heard of it before, a privacy program for email or for emailing called PGP, which is pretty good privacy. It's actually used for a lot of things, but it's most accessible in emails where you have a, an encrypted email, you can send it to somebody, and then they have to have a password to unlock it. We actually use that technology at, with our company at Bitcoin.com. We, we want our messages to m maintain a level of security and privacy, and everybody should want that. And that's what he created, and it was all a legacy or a testament to this cypherpunk movement. So this is why cryptocurrency came into existence. This is the, the message is anti-authoritarianism. It's anti-government. It's not, oh, Lambos and Moon. That's great. I love that too. I've, I've, I've done, like I said, I've done really well. A lot of people in the cryptocurrency space have done really well, even with a lot of the altcoins. But if your cryptocurrency technology has shifted your view away from the original vision or you never understood the original vision, you've completely missed the bus. This tech, this, you've, you've adopted a, this mainstream idea that it's just about the asset. It's just about making money. It's like it's a stock or some kind of basic bond or something that should just be in your portfolio it's a lot more than that it's a lot guys, deeper those guys in the community are called uh, hodlers or <laughs> hold on for, yeah. hold on for dear life oh, yeah. hold on for and, dear lifers yeah and that's that, that's true and let, let's be clear i'm not against hold on for dear life it, it, increasing the value prop of <laughs> currency is good because it does attract more people but you also have to be able to use actively use these currencies mm -hmm. these technologies 
you don't if you don't use them, we're not growing. Yeah. It's so it's, it's a bit of a tra- it's a bit of a trade off, right? If you want to push the price up, you're not using the currency for what it was meant for. So has that pushed people onto things like utility coins? Ah, yeah, yeah. That's that's a, that's a good point. So if yeah, if people want to actually use use cryptocurrencies or they want to use different kinds of cryptographic systems, and maybe they want to do something more than just hold tokens or or try to use them for payments. They can get on to different kinds of new cryptocurrency platforms or crypto token platforms that have more utility. You mentioned the utility platforms. One of them that comes to mind is, is Steemit. And this is a beautiful thing also for what we talked about with Freeing Society. So it's basically a, it's a blogging platform. A person can get on and they can write a blog. And just like Reddit, somebody can upvote their blog content. And this is how it works. It, it's ingenious. It's probably one of the most brilliant ideas in the cryptocurrency space that I've noticed. It's called delegated proof of stake. And what this means is somebody can upvote content. And when they upvote content, depending on how much cryptocurrency in that ecosystem they have, they delegate the blockchain rewards. We mentioned, I talked about that in the techniques of blockchain earlier. When a block is complete, the miners get a reward. So instead of miners getting a reward on this platform, if you upvote a blog post, those rewards are delegated based on upvotes to different people's blog posts. Yeah. It's absolutely ingenious because what that means is you can verify and timestamp and maintain the blockchain in a way that allows you to do it through a model of giving, through a model of trustless mm-hmm. appreciation of people's content. Now, this is not just, Steemit is not just this delegated proof of stake, they also have a witness system that is based on traditional mining, proof of work mining, essentially where you're you're managing the, the blockchain through using your computing resources and power. And this is what I think an important technical piece of the evolution of the technology. We're noticing that a mixture of say delegated proof of stake or proof of stake and proof of work, which is the mining process we talked about, a combination or a permutation of the, these attributes allow mining to take place more efficiently. And Steemit is a perfect example of that. And a little known fact, Steemit is actually one of the blockchains that has some of the most blockchain activity, some of the most transactions that are that take place. It's got a very high throughput level mm-hmm. compared to some of these other blockchains. The creator of Steemit, his name is Daniel Larimer, absolute brilliant guy. The technology is what he referred to to this system as is a grapheme blockchain, grapheme technology. And it's a brilliant use of a utility token because it's not just money, it's not just a cryptocurrency, it's already another app, right? So it allows you to actually store steam power is what they call it on the blockchain where you can store the token and use it as a utility on the blockchain to get to give you power, to give you influence, to upvote people's content to the top, like in Reddit, you upvote things and they get on fire. On Steemit, they get they get raised to the top, plus that person actually gets more reward, mm-hmm. so it's legitimate power, monetary power, monetary value on a blockchain. And then and anybody can engage in the system, even if you don't have a lot of money to like invest in it or come from the outside in, you can just start writing blogs. And this is actually how I accumulated a lot of value in cryptocurrency early on. I was an early adopter of Steemit. I wrote, started writing blogs. I already had an anarchist platform. So I had a lot of people. I said, come follow me, guys. Come along with me to this Steemit platform. Let's use this. So they came over. They up, started upvoting my content. Next thing I know, I wrote an introduction post and made $3,000. I wrote a couple of regular posts after that, anarchist posts. I wrote some peaceful parenting posts. Yeah. Made $1,000, made $800, made $500. So I think in one month, I made like 30k, and this was, this was in 2016, uh, mid 2016. Yeah. So the big, the price of Bitcoin was like 800 dollars. So speaking of hodling, rather than hodling, just use Steemit, participate in these utility tokens. So, so you're participating in freedom and not working your right. nine to five grind job. You're also making money. At that point in time, I traded a lot of my Steam tokens in for Bitcoin, which was 600 dollars. So you know, at that point, do the math. But it worked out really well, and a lot of people are still using Steemit today to do really well mm-hmm. and sidestep having to use the system yeah. at all. I, I've, I'm familiar with Steemit through Gregory Manorino. I don't know if you mm-hmm. know his YouTube channel. He's more of like a day trader, mm-hmm. but he's sort of like talked about Steemit, and I've heard about, you know, the Steemit coin and stuff mm-hmm. like that. Um, especially looking back at like a lot of those sort of like 
crypto punks and stuff like that. Um, people are talking now about people's tax obligations when it comes to profits from cryptocurrency. And do you think that there will be sort of the IRS cracking down on people's <laughs> uh, income through that? Yeah, so they're, they're already cracking down on people. There was this, you know, incident, I think it was in 2016 or whatever. There was, and there's been a lot of people using Coinbase, which is like the hub for everybody who's a newbie who's getting involved in cryptocurrency and wants to buy Bitcoin, Ethereum, Litecoin. I think they might even still Ripple now. But anyway, some large amount of number of people, I can't remember, it's like, I want to say it, it was a lot, but they didn't file their their taxes on their cryptocurrency. So the IRS actually got into this pitched battle with Coinbase to try to get them to give up information. At first, the IRS wanted the keys to the castle. They wanted Coinbase to give a, give them everything. Give us your, <laughs> give us your all your security information. Give us your passwords. Give us your 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 names. Give us all the details of all their account information and all the transactions they ever did. Well, Coinbase pushed back and said, "Listen." That's impossible for us to do even if you wanted it. We can't just give you everything like that because it would take away all of our business. It would be impossible. And plus that data, you guys aren't exactly known for keeping data safe. We give you all that data, next thing you know, hackers got it and then, and then everybody screwed. So they pushed back. They ended up just doing a deal where the IRS got just individuals information who transacted over like 20 or 30K. And they've continued that process. They're gonna continue that process for some, some other years. And I'll, I'll disclose some information. I used Coinbase last year and I transacted more than 30K on Coinbase. Coinbase sent me a cease and desist letter for that their protocol and said I need to file a W-9 and give them my, my tax information and give them my social security number. Well, what I said was no thank you. I'm not going to provide that information with you. And I effectively stopped using Coinbase at that point. So that's that's just one of those things they want. They're they're going to start going after people mm -hmm. through the these central platforms, and this is again an Achilles heel. Of, of do you, do you believe that's an issue with the exchanges, or is that something that maybe the inherent coin could fix? No, no, I think this is something the coin can fix. I, I think either either off camera or on camera, you mentioned the privacy coins like Monero. There are cryptocurrencies that allow people to get completely outside the scope of dealing with the state that are completely untraceable. But yes, right right now, because of the nature of the time of where we're at, people are using these centralized exchange platforms, and these centralized exchange platforms require they're easy to they're easier for government to regulate, and governments require them to follow the the AML and the KYC laws, so the anti money laundering and the know your customer laws. So if you get on those platforms and you use them, especially if you start transacting a lot of money, you have to put all your identifying information with them, give them your ID, take a screenshot all of this other nonsense. And that way they can, if they wanted to, they can trace back any individual's transactions on Coinbase at any time. But this is what's happening. This is, a, this is gonna be a thing of the past, these centralized exchanges. We're starting to build decentralized exchanges right now that allow for peer-to-peer -peer transactions between people where they don't have to put up a lot of information and, and this is legit. There's one called BitSquare, the BISC network, where people can actually trade fiat for crypto in a peer-to-peer -peer fashion by depositing money in an account and then receiving crypto. And a decentralized arbiter oversees this to make sure that nobody tries to scam the system. Now, there's not a lot of volume on this platform, and what we call the UI and the UX is actually horrible. There's no user experience. There's no user interface. It's, it's really bad. But given time, not much time, little bit of times in this space, time is relative, right? right? Because we may wake up tomorrow and the whole thing has changed and it's a, a new, new platforms and new emergent systems and emergent properties. So it won't be long and these decentralized systems will be in full effect and we'll have more coins and probably even ideas I can't think of right mm -hmm. now about how to get around these governmental systems. Because I think it's natural for people in the cryptocurrency space, especially programmers and developers, people on that level, entrepreneurs are looking for ways to not have to deal with the government because the government is so intrusive, and central banking as well, so intrusive, so monopolistic, and so antagonistic toward innovations that nobody can actually participate in the economy at large without having to go through a bunch of red tape. But here's what's happened. People have started to say, we're done with this red tape. We're done with your nonsense. We're done with your, your monopoly on these 
financial technology. So what we're going to do is we're just going to innovate at the edges, as Andreas Antonopoulos has said. We're going to move outside the scope and on the fringes of where you're working, and we're going to build our own technologies. There's a quote. I went to a conference in San Francisco called Startup Society Summit, and their slogan was, don't argue, build. That's what we're doing. That's pretty awesome. So is Bitcoin... Well, you're, sorry, are cryptocurrencies being treated as um, assets more than they are actual currencies at this moment? Yeah, the, well, the IRS looks at, they treat cryptocurrencies as property, right? They look at it as, as property. So this means if you go and buy a cup of coffee, say with your Bitcoin or Bitcoin Cash, technically you're supposed to admit that as a capital gain, right? So you have to keep track of capital gains and losses for the purposes of your tax revenue and your tax information. And anybody who works in the cryptocurrency space know that's an absolute absurdity. You're not going to keep track of every little transaction Mm -hmm. you do. And not only do you have to keep track of those transactions, you have to keep track of when it goes up and when it comes down because those are capital gains and capital losses as well. It's an absolutely silly system that was purposely implemented by the IRS to make things difficult for cryptocurrency people. And I think a lot of folks have already said, to hell with this system. We're going to continue building. We're going to try to work our way around it. And I think that's a good thing. The cypherpunk movement has to be alive and well. We have to get outside the scope of these monopolistic, nasty systems where these these sociopaths who wear American pin lapels are trying to control us and do everything they want to make sure that we stay living as serfs in society. I guess it needs, like, um, a lot of support for it not to... um, I guess, fall by the wayside. Degrade into that, sort of. Yeah, that's. there's a mixture of things going on. I think a lot of the things that happen in the cryptocurrency space happen in such a way that it naturally propels people to more freedom. Because if you're Mm -hmm. using the technology, a lot of times you'll you'll get a freedom mind because you're already having to take self-responsibility into account. Because when you use cryptocurrency, you have to keep track of it yourself. Now there's not a custodian that's always watching over your funds. So it, it... actually empowers that kind of behavior. Mm-hmm. If, if cryptocurrency were more mainstream or more easy to use, would that be antithetical to kind of the subversion that, uh, that, that it, it, its a, a primary intention was? You know, like if, um, like the futures contracts, Thing, right? Am, am I, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah I, I get what you're saying. You're saying if, if, if cryptocurrency or Bitcoin becomes more more mainstream, is it going to undermine the original vision sure. of, the, of the thing? Yeah. So, no, I I don't think that's the case. But I also think it depends on people who are involved in the space and the message that they're sending to people. I think education is extremely important. I think as it grows, there needs to be a continual troop of individuals who are constantly saying, "Listen." This, this is a, there's a specific reason why we're using this technology, and if you forget about that reason, you're just going to make you're going to maintain the bondage that you live in. It's mm-hmm. going to be a nasty thing. And just a brief story: I was in San Francisco, California, doing a conference in it's a crypto funding conference. There's a bunch of ICOs or initial coin offerings, people wanting to create new tokens on the Ethereum blockchain. And during that whole conference, all their interests were is how to stay in compliance with the with the government, with the Securities and Exchange Commission. And it was funny, I went up to the, the stage to give my keynote presentation, and I, my second slide or third slide said government regulations are immoral, and people literally started laughing at me. So that goes to tell you some of the mentality that's yeah. actually happening in the space. All these new capital management firms and these institutional and investors like are getting involved. Like the, the Winklevoss twins. That's oh, right. No way. Were they there? Yeah, they're, they're, they're just trying they to weren't at that, that conference, but he's right. They, they, these are the people getting involved, and they don't have these... These, li- these strongly liberty ideas in mind. Like, like they're, 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 trying, they're, trying to, they're trying to start an ETF, which is essentially like... It makes it You're not even owning Bitcoin or whatever the cryptocurrency is. That's right. You're owning a fund, which may or may not have some exposure to that. Right. So, yeah. Yeah, so. You're, you're right. And, that, you, the, the, and that's an interesting subject. That could undermine 
cryptocurrencies. It could, I think, it's helped like the price in the short term, the short term. Yeah. which, which is fine. But, but, but you're right. The, the thing is, when people use ETFs, they're actually not using a blockchain with an exchange traded fund. Yeah. The, 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 like they're, they're legacy con- technology. Yeah, that's right. They're, those contracts are settled later on the dollar, right? They're yeah. not settled on the yeah, blockchain. Exactly. They're just betting on the price, yeah. long and short, of cryptocurrency and Bitcoin. So. I say to hell with those exchange traded yeah. funds. Just use actual cryptocurrency. People will use that kind of stuff for a little while, but all of it will go to the wayside as we continue innovating. Yeah. And I'm very, I'm very firm on that belief. And I, I feel like with my own trading, I do own ETFs that uh, cover certain markets and precious metals, maybe. But I know in my own strategy that it, when the bull market, I do believe a bull market will turn. But those are the first things I'm going to sell early on, right? Because I don't believe they have any real true backing and I'm holding those as they are a bit, they're hollow assets, but you know, it, they still go up. And in my opinion, the, the check cash is all the same. Sure. Yeah. And I think, I mean, they have, they'll have value validity for a little time. Like you yeah. said, it's no worries. On that note, guys, we got to take one more quick break. I promise we'll wrap up now. <laughs> Third segment, too bad, too late. Sterling Leon, Bitcoin.com. Any final words to the unwashed plebs? <laughs> no, I about think about cryptocurrency. Right. I, I think that anybody who gets into the cryptocurrency space, which I think everybody should because it's an amazing space, whether you're just a noob and you're just getting introduc- in, introduced to the space. Always remember where the technology came from. I think that's the big keystone message that I've talked about from the very beginning, whether it had to do with a scaling debate or had to do with the purpose of the technology, which is what we talked about in the second half of our of our little shindig here. Everyone should remember that it's all about freedom. It's all about economic liberty. And if we can't exercise economic li- liberty and freedom in society, then we've already lost. We've already become drones who are... In, well integrated into society and we don't have a soul or a consciousness or ability to act on our humanness, on our volition, on who we actually are. So we have to exercise these attributes of our humanness or we're not living. You know, Terrence McKenna used to say that the primacy of experience or direct experience is one of the most important things in order to live a fully conscious life. And I think that's what it, I'll leave everybody with. Everybody should always know that whether you get and that's whether you get in the cryptocurrency space or not but the purpose of the cryptocurrency space is to liberate people don't be confused by all of the rhetoric and nonsense out there about making money great that's good make money because it helps us live freer but it's not the ultimate purpose of the technology you sold on bitcoin am i gonna uh, I don't know. I'm looking into Monero. I might get into. I think there's a premium on privacy. Bingo. Okay. Yeah. What are you gonna do with your Monero? Just hold it and trade it and yeah. buy it's, it's buy your stuff. Business. You're not yeah, gonna... that's the whole point why I'm getting Monero. Yeah. So you don't know what I'm gonna do with it. Okay. Stop asking me questions. Okay. No, because cash. They take cash. <laughs> right, they do. Yeah. Well, they I'm gonna... do. Explain to a hooker, well, you're going to go open a Monero wallet. <laughs> They're going to do that. So we're going to trade this. And Honey, do you want us. your dick sucked or not? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. So we're going to a completely well-informed podcast is going to end on that note. Yeah. No, but uh, we really appreciate your uh, stopping by. Bitcoin.com, yeah. Sterling Lujan. Please. I really, man, like I, I want to jump in so bad just to say that, hey, I was a part of that wave when it was most relevant, Right. I guess. I don't, I, know, I don't know if it's peaked yet. Well, I'll leave you with this. If you haven't fully jumped in, you're you're here tomorrow, right, at the conference? I am. Yeah. Okay, so come down to our Bitcoin.com booth. We'll set you up on a Bitcoin.com wallet and give you some free Bitcoin cash, and boom, you're in. Oh, yep, we're in. We're oh, locked in. Bingo. We're in the matrix now. <laughs> we're in the matrix. Yep, okay. you're, you're, you're locked in, or you're actually out of the matrix. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> okay, Sterling Lujan, too bad, Cheers. too late, Bitcoin.com.